So we've got a little bit of material to sort of work through on the notes from Tuesday, and then we'll jump into the new material as far as the failure theories. So a quick kind of review of what we looked at on Tuesday. We were solving members to determine on a differential element with the normal stress shear stresses. But uh, so we went through that sort of general procedure, and what we're really ultimately interested in is what's the max stress that our element can have. And sometimes that max stress would be on a rotated plane that's not just your dominant XYZ coordinate system. So we had general stress transformation equations that are shown here that if we just want to apply, you know, take a state of stress, element and you want to rotate it about some angle, you can just plug and chug into those equations to find out the corresponding normal and shear stresses on that rotated plane. What we ultimately really want though, so that's kind of just arbitrary any sort of angle, we really want to know what those maximums are. And so those maximums were known as principal stresses. Those are your max normal stress. And so they're denoted by the subscript sigma 1 for the maximum, meaning most positive stress, and sigma 2 being the minimum, most negative stress uh, that you have on your uh, differential element. So you've got that sort of equation, um, and the sigma, sigma 1 is just going to be the first term plus the square root term, and the sigma 2 value is just going to be the first term minus the square root term. Often that's the critical thing, is just to determine the value. If you want to know the rotated angle at which that occurs, which might help you to predict like that failure plane that we saw on that beam, then you can solve for that, uh, solving that tangent of 2 theta t. If we want to solve just for the max shear stress, we've got that equation for tau max. And similarly, if you want to know that rotated plane, you can solve for that. And that rotated plane for your uh, shear stress is always going to be 45 degrees from the principal stresses. So uh, that's kind of the basic. And you know these equations are sort of plug and chug. The last topic we're going to cover from chapter 9 is known as Moore circle. And so I kind of alluded to that at the end of, whoops, where are these? Where are these? There we go. Uh, at the end of class when I just took those basic stress transformation equations and plotted them. And what we saw, if you plot sigma x versus tau xy, it ends up being a circle. So today we're going to practice the same skills, um, but specifically we're going to plot that Moore circle. And I think the visual representation of how the stresses transform as you rotate an element, uh, it's a nice presentation with that with Moore circle. And it can help sort of reinforce the big picture concepts. To get to Moore circle, we've got these basic stress transformation equations that we started with in chapter 9. And from there, there's just a little bit of manipulation to those equations. We take one term uh, from the right side of the sigma x prime equation, bring it to the left. We've got this same basic tau xy prime equation that we started with. And then we add sigma x prime with that term, that equation with the tau xy prime equation. So we just add those two equations together, and then we square the terms. And so we get this sort of general expression there equal to this general expression there. And by doing that manipulation, this actually arrives at the equation on the side. Uh, this term here, and uh, plus this Here 
So to create more circle, that sigma average, sigma x plus sigma y, that is going to be the center of the circle. Sigma average, so, so the plot axis here, this is your uh, sigma x prime value, this is your tau x y prime axis. So the center of the circle is your average normal case. And that radius, that r term, that was the right side of the equation above, is that square root of x minus y over 2 quantity squared plus tau x y quantity squared. That's the radius of the circle. And if you quickly compute the average, calculate the radius, and from the radius, you instantly can determine kind of the three values that you really are interested in. This rightmost value, that's your largest normal stress. Rightmost value right here, that is your sigma 1, your principal normal stress, your largest normal stress. You take the center of the circle and subtract the radius, that's going to give you your minimum normal stress. That's sigma 2. Another thing just to sort of make sure we're understanding these concepts, when we have our principal stresses, sigma 1 or sigma 2, what is the corresponding shear stress on that given cell? Anyone remember? It's zero. So for a plain stress, uh, uh, state of stress on your differential element, there's a rotated angle at which all the normal stress and all the shear stress gets translated into only normal stress, no shear. And so that's critical because you know this horizontal axis here, that's when tau xy is equal to zero. Max normal on the right, sigma 1, minimum normal, sigma 2, we're on that horizontal axis where the shear is zero. So those are two critical points, right, that we want to know. A third critical point that we want to know is what's the max shear stress that our element is going to experience? Any guesses on that? Circle where the max shear stress is? Yeah. So right here, right here, right? So that's where you're going to get max. And the difference is just going to be plus tau x, y, and minus tau x, y. So the magnitude is going to be in the bottom. So that's where you get your max shear stress. And your max shear stress just corresponds to the radius. So really by sort of knowing those two values, your average normal stress on your differential element, and then you compute that radius term, you can solve for all the critical things that you really wanted to solve for. Questions on that basic concept there? Um, OK, so that's the, the starter there. The sign convention we have for this is generally what you'd expect for normal stress. That the positive direction is to the right, and so um, we're going to get larger positive values to the right, smaller values, perhaps even negative values. You know, this vertical axis here, this is your axis when normal stress is equal to zero. So your more circle is fully to the right of that, that just means that your principal stresses, your sigma 1 and your sigma 2, they're 
positive, both positive, so they're both in tension. If you have a Mohr circle where you've got your tau xy and your sigma x prime value, you can have a Mohr circle like this. The critical components we just talked about are always the same. This is going to be your sigma 1. This is going to be your sigma 2 right here from the center. You know, right there's your tau xy, tau max. Those are the same, but sign convention, here you've got a sigma 1 that is positive. Conversely, sigma 2 is negative. So that just means that you're on your differential element at whatever rotated angle. Ooh. rotated angle theta, you've got sigma 1 being positive and sigma 2 being negative. So it's compressive. Okay. Uh, so I was talking about normal stress, so that sort of sign convention there is um, what you would expect. Shear stress is a little atypical, and this is uh, specific so that the rotated angle uh, works out as you would expect. So shear stress, your positive direction and our, on our differential element, we had up on the positive x face and to the right on the positive y face, that's what we were calling positive tau xy. So that theta stress, where we would depict that on our more circle is positively inclined. So if, for example, uh, you have a starting sigma x and a starting tau xy, and let's just say this is, I don't know, positive 80 ksi, and this is uh, positive um, 40 ksi, for example. And you can, yeah, you've got some sigma y value, let's say that is, uh, I don't know, 20 ksi. Those were your numbers that you started with. Sigma average, 80 plus 20 divided by 2, 50. You know, that's going to be your 50 KSI normal stress value. And then if you want to plot, well, where am I at on my circle? What you would do is you come from your circle point, you come over to your sigma x value, 80 ksi, and then you'll come down to your tau xy value, 40 ksi. And so that data point there on your circle, that is your sigma x comma tau xy value point, which in this example would be 80 ksi and 40. So that downward direction is not what we'd expect, but as long as you remember that and uh, follow that, from that we can then solve for our rotated value directly for more circle. So we created a more circle using the center of the circle, the radius, created our shape, we plotted where our current state of stress is, and that current state of stress is just on your differential element, you know, I had a 80 KSI example. This was 20 KSI, these are both tension. And then my
my italics y was 40. So I had 40. From that original state of stress, we want to figure out well, what is that rotated value to get to our principal stresses there. We can visually see it. We've got some rotation to that on our Bohr circle. And the only thing that we have to sort of keep track of from our stress transformation equations is that the stress transformation equations, all the trigonometric are all sine, cosine, t theta. Um, so that the um, so 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 that all come into play when we sort of see our, our sigma x and our sigma y value on our Bohr circle. But so that there is going to be our, our rotated value theta, and so then we solve for that theta and the mean is the value over your sigma x minus sigma y rotation value. The rotated sign convention is the same. There's no um, right hand rule. So counterclockwise rotation is positive. That's just kind of depicting what I just sort of uh, mentioned. So the basic sort of rules to follow, and we'll now jump into an example. You've got first to determine the center of your circle, that's your uh, sigma average. Then you compute the radius of the circle. From that, you can go ahead and plot your circle directly. Okay, you know where your average is. You, you can calculate sigma 1, sigma 2. Sigma 1 just being the center plus R, sigma 2 being the center minus R. And then if you want to solve for what the orientation is of that principal plane, you have to plot your original state of stress, sigma x and tau xy. And then determine which way you want to, which direction you need to Questions before we jump into an example? Okay, so the example we have here is this one. So this is our original state of stress. So we want to plot more circle from this. So if we stick with our typical Cartesian coordinate system, so this is our x, y direction, what is our starting value for sigma x? Uh, so for sigma x, so sigma x will be, be this one in the x direction. So we've got sigma x is equal to 50 MPa. It's in tension, so that's positive. Sigma y, what's our start value? Negative 10. And tau xy, what's our start value? Positive or negative? Correct. Okay. Yep. Yes. The arrows would be pointing instead of the top right corner. They'd be pointing at the bottom, bottom right corner. Yep. Okay. Uh, so that's what you have. Uh, should I leave the summary equations up here while you work on that? Useful. 
Does anyone, I do have a handful of uh, worksheets from my previous one. Anyone need this equation page more?
Oke. Okay. Oops. Okay, I'll go ahead. I think most people look like they were making some progress. So our sigma average, that's going to be the center of the circle. So that's sigma x plus sigma y over 2. So that's 50 plus a negative 10 over 2. So that's our 20 megapascals. Our radius square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 quantity squared plus tau xy quantity squared. So that's your 50 minus a minus 10 over 2 squared plus 40 squared. So we do that math, we solve, we get the radius is 50 MPa. Questions on either of those? So our principal stress on the right is just going to be center plus radius. So 20 plus 50 equals 70 MPA. Our sigma 2, our minimum normal stress on the left, is just the center minus your radius. So 20 minus 50 minus 30 MPA. And then your tau max that's just equal to your radius, so that's you know, plus or minus 50 MPa. So let's go ahead and look at a plot of this. So if I take vertical axis, and to help me remember that positive tau xy is in the downward direction, I just usually draw my arrow pointing down, and then my sigma x stays in there, and I guess officially these are So I'm going to add a few little uh, tick marks here to help me sort of try and make this to scale. So let me go. Okay, so those are my scale marks. So I've got the center of my circle is at 20 MPa. And so I just go my 20 data point right there, it's positive 20. My sigma 1 is going to be at 70, so I just come over from that five tick marks. One, two, five right there. So that's my sigma 1 0 data point right. It's going to be 
sigma comma tau value. My sigma two is minus 30, right there. And my tau max plus or minus 50. So it's basically right there. So those are kind of like my five data points there. I don't know that I did that perfectly to scale, but you know, then I would try and sketch in my best circle, well, let me try a little better than that. Looks more egg-shaped, but I'm not the best artist here. So, a more accurate plotting of that, it would be a nice perfect circle. Hopefully that's good enough to, to get the point there. The questions on the initial sort of plotting of more circles. <laughs> Compass? No. Yeah. Uh, it sort of depends on what's being asked, you know, so I mean sometimes like, so this is saying um, to determine principal stresses in the max incline corresponding. Uh, so with this, you know, really the values are right here and then just showing an accompanying plot of that, that's sufficient. I'm going to go ahead and take this one step further and solve for the Sigma P, the rotated angle that we would need to go from that starts and intersects at the zero. Yeah? What, what was the purpose of the, was that the whole idea of the compass was to find the max value of combined stresses to compare against the failure value? So if we can find it without data, what is the whole purpose? Data is helpful just to understand the big picture. And uh, the beginning of the notes for chapter nine, you know, we kind of had that example, right? We loaded this beam until we got failure. And then the failure that we observed was this like big crack going up diagonally. And we're wanting to, using our understanding of materials, understanding of internal stresses makes sense of it. Like, why is it doing that? Why is it not failing? You know, big crack coming right up in the middle. That's where the max moment is. Why, why, why do you not just see a big failure plane going up here? Why is it doing that? And so we're trying to understand that. And if we, uh, based on our state of stress of our members, so we could sort of take certain spots as it varies up the members, and each one of those has a different state of stress, and we could create, um, you know, you, you can just sort of plug into those equations, and those plug in, plugging into the equations will give you a, uh, an answer, but it's hard to sort of understand, like, you know, that's just a number, what does that mean? And having a more circle plot shows you instantly how, as you rotate your member, the stresses, normal, and shear vary. And so it's a very visual tool that you can quickly see like, oh, well, this is where my, I currently am on my state of stress. I, you know, if we rotate here, that's when we get maximum. What's that angle? That might be what I would expect that crack to develop at. So hopefully that helps justi justify the exercise a little bit. For just the values, it's not necessary, but it does really help reinforce that big picture understanding. And just it's, it's a little bit abstract to, you know, you've got your, uh, 
you've got your member, you've got some sort of loading on it, you know, we're sectioning that member, you've got your differential element, and then we've got normal, normal stress, shear stresses on that element, um, and then some rotated plane. It's, oh, for me, that gets a little abstract and a little like, let's, I'm losing myself. I, sure, I can see the equations, and I can plug in and get an answer, but to make sense of it, it's harder for me to do that. I get kind of lost in that rabbit hole, but that's where I like more circle because it's a very visual tool that is quick to produce, and then you can just kind of see like, oh, as I take this initial differential element that you know is in my original Cartesian plane, as I rotate it, I can just visually see on that circle how the normal stress and shear stress varies. So, uh, if we want to plot on Mohr circle our original state of stress, so it's 50 minus 10 to 40 on this side of the plane. How do we do that? So, what we do is we just go along our x axis until we get to x equals 50. So, uh, we are 20, 30, 40, 50. So, right here is 50. And then our tau is 40, and so we're coming down because this is the positive direction for tau. So that data point right there is our original state of stress, sigma x comma tau xy, which is 50 comma 40. If we look on the opposite side of the circle, it's directly opposite. The rotation that you do along your Mohr circle is two times theta. So that means that, that 180 degrees difference angle, as far as theta is concerned, it's only 90. That's our 90 degrees, right? So if this is sigma x prime, but if you just draw a straight line from your state of stress through the center to the opposite side of the circle, that is your sigma y. comma, tau xy stress. Okay, so last thing I want to do is uh, to determine theta p, which is the uh, rotation to sigma 1 so if I take my original state of stress and I rotate that differential element that angle that angle is going to be 2 times theta p I can determine that rotation is. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So P is just the principal stresses. So uh, theta P is the angle that we have to rotate our differential element until we get to the principal stresses. And sigma s is what we have to rotate our element until we get to the max shear stress. Sigma s. So 
Did I say it wrong? Sometimes I do. Yep. But the nice thing, um, looking at our Warner circle, is that you know it's relatively simple geometry here. Uh, that this value on this side of the right triangle is tau x y. The difference right there. Um, This is sigma x minus sigma y. It says the opposite side of the circle is sigma y, this is sigma x. So that horizontal distance is the difference between those values. And if you take half that, that's sigma x minus sigma y over 2. So we kind of know what these values are. And so solving for, this will probably look familiar, tangent of 2 theta is equal to tau xy over sigma x minus sigma y over 2. If we look at our, oops, an equation, that we are plugging and chugging to, we can see visually where that comes from on the Mohr circle. So it's usually relatively straightforward to sort of see and solve this. And once we know where sigma 1 is, on our Mohr circle, what's the angle of difference from sigma 1 to tau max? So what's the angle difference from here to here? On the circle, it's 90 degrees, right? And the circle is 2 times theta. So that means that on our differential element, the, di the amount we have to rotate our element to go from principal stresses to max shear stress is always 45 degrees. Okay, so uh, this is our uh, equation there, tangent of 2, theta p equals tau xy. And so for this scenario, our tau xy is 40 over sigma x was our 50 minus a minus 10 all over 2. So that is 4 thirds. So we do the arc tan that gives us 2 theta p is equal to 53.1 degrees so that the actual rotation of our differential element is half that 26.6 degrees. And so that just means if I were to depict my differential element get to my principal stresses, this rotation right there is going to be 26.6 degrees, and that'll give me sigma 1 and sigma 2. So in this case, sigma 1 is tensile stress of uh, 70. Sigma 2 is a compressive stress of 30. For shear. That's because uh, the example we looked at said uh, we were solving for a clockwise rotation. But then when we solved the actual problem, that was a minus a theta equals minus 30 degrees.
it's counterclockwise is our typical right hand rule for rotation. Is this making sense or not making sense? How many people think it's making sense? Okay. How many people say no? A little bit? Okay. Uh, well, practice makes perfect, right? Um, so I think big picture, it's got to sort of marinate on that a little bit. But the more circle is just that graphic representation on you take an element with a given state of stress, Rotate it with different orientations out of the normal stress. But the big picture takeaway here from all of this is that ultimately we're really interested in max normal and I. I guess that could also be min normal because we want both values because in the event that max normal is tensile and min normal is compressive, it could make sense that our member is going to fail in either max tension or max compression. And then the other scenario we want is sort of max shear because another scenario is that well, maybe our material is going to fail in shear so wherever that is maximum that's going to be It can't be higher, no, but based on a molecular level um, and the ability of that material to withstand either a stress perpendicular or in the plane, some materials are less able to resist the stress. There. And so it's not that it's going to be a bigger stress, it's just that that stress might happen to be Okay, so um, so that ties directly into the next um, next segment as far as failure theory. Let's see here. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break, and we'll come back at eleven and jump into the next unit. All right. So, all this kind of effort as far as stress transformation, you know, however we look at it, solving for those max normal and max shear stresses, all of it's really so that we can answer this question. Is our material going to fail or not? And so, the that's what we're looking at. We, we jump from chapter 9 to, to chapter 10.7 where we look at various theories. And so the theories presented in the book are limited to four theories. These are four of the leading theories, but they're not exhaustive. There are other theories. Uh, it's a topic of, of research you know, that um, happens. Um, but these are four of the common theories that are used Which theory we use varies depending on if our material is classified as ductile or brittle. And so if we have a ductile material, we're going to look at two theories. And both these theories we'll see are really similar to each other. And so in practice, we can use either or. There's not a... Um, requirement that you use one or the other. Um, we, we can use either and they're both pretty similar so there's not going to be a substantial difference. For brittle materials uh, there's two options and which option we use 
is a little bit more uh, specific in that based on the stress relationship for the material, if it's ultimate stress and, and tension and ultimate stress and tension are the same values, then we typically use this third max normal stress criterion versus if the stress, ultimate stress and tension is different than ultimate stress and compression, then we typically use Moore's criterion. And so there's kind of like a, a hierarchy here when you're looking at failure theory, you've got um, a, you know, material type, and then you got to figure out is it ductile or brittle and if it's ductile you can you've got two options and both are fine doesn't really matter with brittle um, you look at the ultimate tension and versus ultimate compression. And if they're the same, then you use one option. If they're different, then you use your other option. So that's kind of generally the, the criterion or the, the flow chart there to, to select which one of these four we're going to be evaluating as we're going. So we're just going to look at uh, the ductile materials first and do an example, and then we'll uh, do the brittle material. So option one as far as the theory for ductile materials, says, I think our material is going to fail due to shear. So our material is, when it reaches the max shear stress that it can take, it's going to fail due to shear. So that's the basic theory. And there are materials uh, that have exhibited this behavior in practice but if you have a material and you float it in axial tension, you keep floating it and you keep loading it. Um, when it gets close to failure and uh, the material on a microscopic level can be sort of investigated, sometimes you'll start to see um, these slippage planes occurring in a microscopic level occurring at 45 degree angles to the applied load. And like we just talked about with the more circle, that max shear stress occurs at a 45 degree angle to your max shear stress. So that those slippage planes that you visually, uh, visually can see on a microscopic level is consistent with the shear stress. Um, so, looking at that on more circle here, in this sort of loading scenario where you've got big stress in one direction, we want to create more circle for this differential element. That differential element, as far as a state of stress, has, in this case, um, you know, a sigma in this direction, zero on the corresponding side, and there's no shear, right? We're just loading it directly in tension. So this differential element actually is looking directly, you know, at sigma one and sigma two on this other side is zero. So your more circle starts at your 
how x, y axis for sigma is zero and goes to whatever that max tension over area that you pointed at, that's going to be your max normal stress. And so the theory would be that, well, you can't hold that material greater than your yield stress, but once you get to that yield stress, then it's going to yield. And that's what we would classify as failure. So that max normal stress is going to occur when we reach yield. And so that, by definition, means that the shear stress is going to be yield over two. Center of your radius is yield over two. Radius, yield over two. That's your shear stress. So that basic logic says that, okay, if our material reaches a, a shear stress of the yield stress over two, we're going to see observed failure. You can apply this directly just using that scenario. Calculate your max shear stress, verify that it's less than or equal to yield over two, and you can verify that this is met or not. For most of these criterion that we look at, they also have a way of considering or, or visually depicting a failure envelope using just your sigma 1, sigma 2 values. And so this plot that we have over here looks at, this is your sigma 1 axis, vertically this is your sigma 2 axis. And, you know, if sigma 1 reaches yield stress and or sigma 2 reaches yield stress, you would have failure. Conversely, if you're looking in the compressive scenario, compressive scenario, sigma 1 or sigma 2 reaches negative yield stress, you would have failure. And then we just connect Connect the lines there where this is your failure envelope. And so how you can evaluate from this plot whether or not your material um, fails is you calculate sigma 1 and sigma 2 and then you plot it on this sigma 1 versus sigma 2 graph. So if you're sigma 1, if you come to like sigma 1 value, sigma 2 value, if you fall right there, that's where you plot those two values, you're within the allowable region. That shaded area is your allowable region. So your material is not going to fail. Conversely, if you, you know, or over here, or over here, or over here. Anything outside of that shaded region, as far as a plot of your sigma 1, sigma 2 values, then you would have exceeded that shear stress yield over 2, and you would expect failure. So this is ductile material. It's known as max shear stress, and the engineer that developed it was a person by the name of Tresca. And so Tresca is how I've usually seen this called, like if you go into analysis programs. If I can go into my structural analysis program, put a bunch of loading, put a bunch of material properties, uh, run analysis. I can usually, in most structural analysis programs, find a Tresca criterion where it will then evaluate that based on this criteria and tell me it's going to fail or not. Questions on this? Okay, so this is option one, Tresca criterion, and we're saying that it's going to fail due to shear. 
Option two for ductile materials is the idea that um, the energy based, to, based on distortion is ultimately what's going to cause the material to fail. And so what that means, if this is your stress strain plot, and we're looking in the linear region because we don't want to operate beyond that linear region, that that shaded region up to the yield stress, we're saying that that's the energy that the material can absorb. And we see that energy then we would expect failure. So linear portion, shaded region, that's just a triangle. So the value of that triangle, U is the energy, is one half times sigma times your strain. So that's what you've got in the uniaxial case where we're just loading in a single direction. <laughs> In the event that you've got normal stress in both your x and your y, it would be a clean stress scenario. So, slightly more involved equation. And these are stresses once you add in the volume of materials, so the cross sectional area properties uh, to that. Uh, that sort of transforms that equation. And ultimately, you arrive at this area of failure. So you've got this criterion that's saying the energy that's going to be absorbed can't be greater than the yield stress. And the measure of what that energy that's going to be absorbed is as in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2, which is sigma 1 squared minus sigma 1 times sigma plus sigma 2 squared, less than or equal to the yield stress squared. So to evaluate this criterion, all you do is you calculate sigma 1 and sigma 2, you plug it in to that equation, and if that expression is less than the yield stress squared, then you're good. However, if sigma 1, sigma 2 plugged into that equation exceeds the yield stress squared, then we'd expect failure. This expression here is an equation for ellipse. So if we plot that equation for ellipse on a sigma 1 versus sigma 2 axis, this is the shape we get. And so this shape, this is the failure envelope. And so you can either plug directly into that expression to solve it, or you could plot it like we did with the Tresca criterion. And so if you've got a sigma 1, sigma 2 value that falls within that region, then you're OK. Conversely, if you've got any value that falls outside that region, then we'd expect to fail. Questions on Von Misses? So I said Von Misses. Uh, so again, most analysis software you can choose evaluate it on Tresca or evaluate it on Bis von Mises. So you, these are two different approaches. And I said that in reality for ductile materials, you can choose either or. It doesn't really matter. The reason why it doesn't really matter, this is a plot of the Tresca criterion versus the von Mises. 
And so you can see that they're 99% the same. That one is just an ellipse equation, you know, the other one has these sort of straight lines, and when that sort of hexagon is shaped. But they're more or less the same. They're going to give you more or less the same failure envelope. They're just little regions where there's variation. So which one of these is slightly more conservative? Tresca is slightly more conservative, right? Because you could have a sigma 1, sigma 2 value that lands right there. If we evaluated it based on von Mises, we'd say, it's okay. If we evaluated it on Tresca, we'd say, nope, we'd expect failure. So if you're of the conservative persuasion, Tresca will be more conservative. Um, but they're both so close um, that, and, and in general, what we often are doing is that in general, for all of these, we're usually applying a safety factor. So that we're not actually going to load up to yield. We're actually going to have a, you know, an allowable ellipsoid, you know, within here that is instead of maybe sigma y up there, it's sigma y over 2. And so then, you know, in our Tresca allowable shape might be you know, right here. And so since in principle that's what we're doing, and if we were to be evaluating either on, whoops, can't really see that, either on von Misses or uh, Tresca criterion with the safety factor that we utilize, we're really, we've got a cushion there beyond uh, until we do. So we're, we're really kind of even far enough away. Questions on either approach? Okay. I've got... I like to just sort of jump to this. Uh, so I've got some worksheet. Uh, this is the second problem. So probably on a... So what we've got, we've got a state of stress up here in the right corner, and we're told this is a sigma yield for the material of 250 megapascals. So we want to determine whether or not this material will work or fail using the Tresca criterion, work or fail using the von Mises criterion, and then what the safety factor is for each. And so for both, for both, what's that? And so for both of these, you start by calculating sigma 1, sigma 2. And how you choose to do that for this, you could do either way. We, we looked at in chapter 9, a basic sigma 1, sigma 2 equation, plug and chug. Or you can calculate your center of your circle and your radius, and then center plus r, center minus r for sigma 1, sigma 2. Either one's the same, going to give you the same answer. So that's, that's your first step, is calculate your principal stresses.
uh, so this is your, you might be all, zoom out trying to have both of them up there. Can you see that? Is that too small? So with, with both of these, I kind of presented maybe two approaches to do the evaluation. You can either solve for Tresca, you can either solve for your max shear stress and compare it to the yield of two. Or you can use the failure envelope plot. So those are kind of two approaches, both equally valid, they do the same. Um, for doing the safety factor, it's probably easiest to do the safety factor calculating the max year. And for the lawn misses, again, two approaches, equation, plug into, plot, evaluate if it fails, both equally valid. Did, uh, has anyone calculated sigma one? How many people calculated sigma one? Okay, 85, that sounds right. Sigma two? Sigma 45, yep. Okay, so that was the, the critical first step. Let's see here. Boop. So you can uh, do this either way, either just plug and chug with the equations or more circle. Uh, since we just we're doing more circle, I might go ahead and do it that way. So the center of your circle is equal to your average normal stress. And so 
my original state of stress, my sigma x value is plus 80 megapascals. My sigma y value is negative 40 megapascals. My shear stress is plus 25 megapascals. So that average uh, stress there is going to be 80 plus a negative 40 all over 2. So we get 20 MPA. The radius is going to be equal to my max shear stress, right? And that max shear stress is critical for the Tresca criterion. So that's equal to, uh, I've got my sigma x minus a negative 40 over 2 quantity squared plus 25 squared. Oops. So that's equal to 65 megapascals. So the critical elements from that, sigma 1 is equal to center plus R, 85 MPA. Sigma 2 is equal to center minus R, which is minus 45. And tau max is equal to R, which is 65 MPA. So we've got two approaches to evaluate whether or not this works. I'll kind of illustrate both. We've got a sigma one plot and a sigma two plot where the max value is going to correspond with the yield stress here, negative yield stress here, and then just connecting the lines there. So this is 250 megapascals, 250 megapascals. Oops. Zero, negative 250, negative 250, zero. So kind of those data points. So that's kind of my failure envelope. So I can just go ahead and plot my sigma 1 and sigma 2 values. So I go to positive 85. That's roughly like a there. And then I go to minus 45. It's like somewhere right there. So that's my data point. So no failure. Questions on the sigma one, sigma two plot? So that answers the big picture. Uh, to do the safety factor that we're asked to do here, that's kind of hard to do uh, with the plot. So the big picture uh, other alternative for the Tresca is that tau max has to be less than or equal to sigma y over 2. So sigma y over 2, 250 over 2, 125 megapascals is what my max shear stress is. And so the if you take the uh, sigma yield over 2 and divide by your max shear stress, that'll be your safety factor. Max stress over actual stress, 
that cushion between the two is your safety factor. So 125 over an actual max stress of 65 gives us a safety factor of 1.9. Questions on the Tresca criterion? As long as you're kind of making sense of what is sigma one, sigma two, and you're you know, keeping track of what we've been doing this week, then applying this criteria is not super difficult. It, 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 if it seems like this is straightforward, good, because it is. But if you don't understand sort of what we've been doing all week with sigma one, sigma two and stuff, then, then I think this can be just a little confusing because it's building on confusion. Okay, if we want to look at the Vaughn misses, so Vaughn misses criterion, The sigma one, sigma two that we solve for up there, you know, those are those don't vary based on the criterion we're looking at. So you can use those values. And the uh, if I do it the same method that we did for the Tresca, uh, Tresca one, we can look at the plot version first. That you've got a sigma one versus a sigma two plot and that ends up being a ellipse where the values where it's crossing each of these axes you know this is sigma y sigma y minus sigma y minus sigma y there and so then you just have an uh, ellipse that's passing through each of those data points. That's kind of your failure envelope. And so the sigma one from above was 85 and sigma two was minus 45. And you know, the, those sigma y values are your 250. So you're roughly, you know, here, here, something like that. So you're within the envelope, so no failure. But if we want to apply or solve for the safety factor, that's a little bit easier to do with the equation. And the equation for Evaluating bond misses is sigma one squared minus sigma one sigma two plus sigma two squared less than or equal to sigma yield squared. So you can plug in these values 85 squared minus 85 times minus 45 plus negative 45 squared less than or equal to 250 squared. You get some 13,075, less than or equal to 62,500. Obviously, to meet that criterion, so it's just confirming that yes, we're within that envelope, we don't have failure. How do you think we would utilize these values to determine the safety factor? Division, that's part of it. What else would we have to account for with that equation? 
we take the square root of this value over that. That's going to be the safety factor. So the safety factor is going to be equal to the square root of 62,500 over the actual value 1307. So you evaluate that expression and you get a safety factor of 2.19. Questions? Okay. I've got time, I think, to at least present the Riddle scenario. So we had two options for ductile. For brittle, we've got two options as well. So the first critical thing to make note of, if we have brittle materials relating back to our chapter three stress strain diagrams, A brittle stress strain diagram usually looks something more like that. And if that is what our stress strain diagram looks like, we often, for our failure criterion, relate it to sigma ultimate. It's that max stress strain. So. Riddle, we're going to use the ultimate value for that. And uh, if I build out on this stress strain diagram, stress strain diagram for strain and stress, you know, we've often just looked at a tension scenario. But the reality is that you can have Let's take concrete, for example. Concrete, is it good in compression or tension? It's good in compression. So if we look at a stress strain diagram for concrete, in compression, it might look something like this. But in tension, it might look like something like that. You know, so you get a sigma ultimate tension value right there that's much smaller than your sigma ultimate compression value. So concrete's like this. Other materials, it's like if you have uh, maybe a brittle steel. A brittle steel, you've got more or less the same plot tension compression. It's just a more brittle in the ductile space. So depending on the uh, that material type in tension and compression of your uh, material, that's going to determine whether or not you choose this option or option four. If your stress strain diagram is approximately the same in tension and compression, then we use number three. And all we're going to say is that your sigma one, sigma two has got to be less than or equal to your ultimate. So, relatively straightforward, you can just calculate your principal stresses, same as the other criterion, compared to your ultimate. And if you want to do the plot failure envelope like we did on the other examples, you just have a big box with your bounds being plus or minus that old ultimate. Questions on that? All right, so the last last material here, we won't go through the example, but last material, if you've got stress strain diagram like I depicted here for concrete, where its strength and tension is drastically different in compression, then it doesn't make sense to use the logic of uh, 
the previous example. So same engineer Moore developed this failure equation. He says, okay, well let's you know figure out our tension capacity, figure out our compression capacity, figure out our shear capacity, and all three of those more circles, that would be our failure envelope. And if we look at that failure envelope as a plot of sigma 1, sigma 2, like the others, we get this. So it's just that slightly distorted versus the other ones we just looked at because the tension capacity is going to be different than the compression capacity. So we've got those two sides of that uh, scenario. And you can either sort of evaluate it here on a plot, or if you want to evaluate it based on equations, these are your criteria. That your max normal has got to be less than or equal to your ultimate tension capacity. Your max compressive has to be less than or equal to your max compressive stress. And the difference between the two is equal to this range. Yeah? Two questions, yeah. So how the failure looks like is a little bit more on it than brittle or dust valley material. So brittle materials are a little bit more of a rapid snap without real stretching. And dust valley materials is usually a bit more of a stretch. Question? Yeah, so uh, this this here this here is more of a, a straight line. So that's how I would do that. What's that? Yeah, I mean, so that would account for the, the shear stress component. I do. James? James, yeah.